And it's like, did the things that happened in this story really make sense? No. Was it kind of unbelievable and a little bit dumb? Yes. But it was so extremely entertaining, I don't even care about all of that. Hello my sweet angels, it's your girl Jay and today I am here with my final wrap up for August 2024. Yes, I know we are very much into September, but if you watched the first two wrap ups then you know that I was in a bus accident for my job and I got a concussion, a lower back injury, and whiplash and sitting for long periods of time, not for me. Talking for long periods of time, not for me, even though I am a yapper. It's been very hard. We don't feel like we're going to die today, so we are filming, hoping that it'll be up very soon. But I read 25 books this month and we all know I'm a yapper, so without further ado, let us get started. The first book I'm going to talk about is The Great Cool Ranch Dorito in the Sky. That title is a mouthful. But this is by Josh Galarza and I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 stars. After his adoptive mother is diagnosed with cancer, 16-year-old Brett feels like he is losing control. He seeks comfort through food and the comic book that he is writing. When his private journal is spread throughout the school for everybody to see, he delves deeper into his eating disorder. With the help of a new friend named Mallory, he realizes that he might need some help. I thought I was really going to like this. The first few chapters really kicked off with a bang, but then it slowly dissipated as it went on for me. This was a difficult book to read at times. It definitely handles some darker topics and it doesn't shy away from those topics. I did really love that this was a story about a boy with an eating disorder. I think that is a very underrepresented population in literature so it was really nice to see that. Not nice, you know what I'm saying though. I like that this was ultimately a story of self-discovery and self-love. I listened to it on audiobook and I think that the narrator did an amazing job in really emulating this character and his raw emotions. I personally wasn't the biggest fan of the superhero portion of this story. I do understand why it was included and the relevance of it, but it just wasn't for me. But I did really like the relationship or friendship between Mallory and Brett. I think that she really gave him the tough love that he needed. I do think that this book will help a lot of people upon reading it, so I do recommend you pick it up. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5 stars. Next I have Dead Country. This is by Max Gladstone and I gave this one a 3 out of 5 stars. This follows Tara Albernathy. She is on the way to her hometown in order to attend her father's funeral. On the way home she rescues a young woman named Dawn from Raiders and she quickly becomes her apprentice in the craft. So this is the first book in the craft wars and for some reason I just could not get into it. I'm not sure if it's because I have haven't read the craft sequence so I didn't really understand the backstory or anything to do with the craft. I don't think that it was a bad book and I do think a lot of people would enjoy it. I just personally had no idea what was going on. I thought it was a little bit boring. The action doesn't really come forth until quite late into the story. I do have the sequel on my shelves. I just don't know how eager I am to pick it up. I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars. Next up I have Kill Her Twice by Stacey Lee. I gave this one a 3 out of 5 stars as well. This takes place in 1932 in Los Angeles. During this time Lulu Wong is Chinatown's star. When she turns up dead in an alleyway, police aren't really all that concerned, mostly due to her race. So the Chow sisters, May, Gemma, and Peony, decide to figure out what happened to their friend and bring her the justice that she deserves. This was definitely a cover read for me. I think that it is absolutely gorgeous. The murder mystery was okay, and I did want to find out what happened to Lulu, but I can't say I necessarily cared what happened to Lulu. It was nothing that blew my mind in the end. I do think that the ending was quite clever, but I do think that it was a little bit rushed. The story dragged for me for the majority of the book, which was quite disappointing. I did really enjoy the dynamic between the three Cho sisters though. I liked how different they were from one another and it was very obvious how deeply they cared for each other. But overall, it was just an okay read for me. I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars. Next up, I have Castle of the Curse, but this is by Romina Garber and I gave it a 3.5 out of 5 stars. 
After the tragic loss of both of her parents in a subway accident, Estella is left the sole survivor. Estella moves in to La Sombra, which is her ancestral Spanish castle. There, strange things start to happen and Estella uncovers some dark family secrets. I thought the concept of this book sounded so cool, but I truly think that it could have been executed so much better. Estella is definitely an unreliable narrator. She is completely mute during the beginning of the story after the incident that happened with her family. She often hallucinates and can't tell what is real from what is fiction, which definitely makes it difficult for the reader to know what is actually happening. I wasn't the biggest fan of the romance. I think that it was extremely rushed. The insta-love in this is crazy. It took literally 13 days for the romance to be at its peak. And I think that the colossal amount of events that occurred in these 13 days without any real explanation or lead up made it feel a little bit silly in the end. I did really enjoy the castle setting of this. I think that it made for a very gothic atmosphere and that definitely was my favorite part of the story. I think that the descriptions of the location were incredibly done. But like I said, it could have been executed just so much better and I give it a 3.5 out of 5 stars. The next two books are part of the same duology. The first is The Prince and the Apocalypse and the second is Air Actually. These are both by Kara McDowell and I give both of them a 4 out of 5 stars. The first one starts on the senior trip that Ren Wheeler is attending in London. Pretty much everything that could have gone wrong on this trip has gone wrong. So in a last ditch attempt to save the trip, she she decides to go for breakfast at the World's End Cafe, but when she arrives, she discovers that it is actually closed down. When she's there, she runs into a English boy who she quickly realizes is the Crown Prince of England, Theo. He just wants to be away from the castle for the day and evade his very controlling mother, so Ren agrees to help him avoid detection. When they part ways, he gives Ren his phone number and lets her know that if she ever needs a favor, she is more than welcome to call him. When she arrives at the airport late to go home, she discovers that multiple flights have already been cancelled due to the fact that a comet is about to hit Earth and destroy mankind. So she decides to call in her favor to Theo in order to have him fly her home so that she can see her family one last time before the world ends. This was such a fun read. I really did not expect to like it as much as I did. It was so insanely entertaining. It takes place over the span of eight days and it's a countdown to when the comet is going to hit. I thought the countdown at the beginning of each chapter was a great way to kind of raise the stakes of the story. I really liked Ren and Theo as main characters. I think that their banter back and forth was so well done. They definitely had me giggling a couple of times while reading. I loved watching them grow closer together and learn to trust each other as their mission continued. All of the shenanigans that they got up to were so much fun to read about. It also features an adorable doggo, so I mean, what is not to love? We're also left on such a huge cliffhanger on this one, so I immediately picked up Air Actually, which is the sequel and finale to this duology. Like I said, I gave a 4 out of 5 stars to this as well. It pretty much picks up very close to when the first one finishes. And it's like, did the things that happened in this story really make sense? No. Was it kind of unbelievable and a little bit dumb? Yes. But it was so extremely entertaining. I don't even care about all of that. You definitely need to suspend your belief um, for the entire story, but it was so good. The books are just so over the top ridiculous. You can't help but love them. And the cast of characters are just so lovable. You can't help but root for them. I just think Ren and Theo are such cuties and I loved seeing them together again in this one. I think that Theo and Ren had so much chemistry in this one and I just wanted to shake them and yell at them that they needed to figure it the fuck out and make it work because they were just so good together. I really love the spoiled royalty stuck on an island plotline of this. It was so well done. The dynamics of the group were so complex. They really needed to learn how to trust one another in a very short period of time. I really loved seeing Theo's family open up to Ren and it really helped show their true personalities and why they were so guarded in the beginning. We also get a lot more of Comet the Dog, which hello, the goodest boy. You solely need to read this duology just for Comet. Like I said, I highly, highly recommend this duology if you want something quick and quirky and fun this one might be for you. 
Next up, I have This Ravenous Fate by Haley Dennings, and I gave this one a 3 out of 5 stars. This takes place in 1926 Harlem, and it follows the Reapers, who are vampiric-like creatures born from medical experiments who stalk the night. It also follows the Saint family, who hunt these Reapers and keep them at bay. It follows 18-year-old Elise, who returns home after spending five years in Paris to reluctantly take over the family business. Layla is a Reaper who was turned five years ago. She has just been accused of a Reaper attack, so she teams up with Elise in order to clear her name. I was really intrigued by this book. It is advertised as a lesbian vampire ex-vampire hunter romance, and I really wanted to like it, but something about it just didn't work for me. It was quite slow in my opinion. It took me a very long time to get into the story and become invested in these characters. I just personally think that the world building was very lacking in this. I did like the childhood friends to enemies to reluctant allies to lovers angle of the story, but I do wish that the enemies portion of that relationship lasted a little bit longer. I also wish that we had seen more of their childhood friendship and get a glimpse into that part of the story and why they became enemies. I definitely liked Layla the most. I think that her rage and anger was an amazing part of the story. I really liked how she would call Elise out on her prejudiced views and she really wouldn't let her get away with anything. Elise was a little bit harder for me to like. I do think that she was a very complicated character, but I do think that she was quite blind to her privilege, which rubbed me the wrong way, which is why I liked Layla so much for calling her out on that bullshit. But like I said, just something about this didn't work for me. I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars. And then the final book that I will talk about for my August wrap-up 2024 is On the Bright Side by Anna Sorrentino. I gave this one a 3.5 out of 5 stars. This one follows Ellie, who attends a deaf school. It has just been shut down, which causes her to return home to her hearing family. She starts her senior year at a mainstream school, and she is paired up with Jackson, who has been asked to help her kind of settle in. Jackson has recently been struggling with things himself when it comes to his health. At his last soccer game, he costs the team the match when his legs suddenly give out from under him unexpectedly. As Jackson gets to know Ellie, he quickly realizes that she is his safe space when it comes to his heightening symptoms. I read and enjoyed Give Me a Sign by this author, so I was intrigued to see another one of her stories. I thought it was a cute romance between Ellie and Jackson. I think both of their characters were really well done. I think that they had good chemistry, and I loved watching them learn more about each other and trust one another as the story progressed. I definitely liked Jackson more than Ellie. I think at times Ellie kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I think she was very rude to a lot of people in her life. I did understand her frustration with her sister and her parents. Those feelings were very valid, but I do also think that if she had just communicated those feelings in a more productive way, a lot of the issues that she was having could have been resolved quite quickly because it was once she had that conversation. But like I said, I did like Jackson a lot more. I can only imagine the confusion and devastation of his symptoms when they started appearing and he didn't really know what was going on. I liked how Jackson leaned on Ellie and found her as a sort of comfort zone when he was trying to figure out his diagnosis and new disability. I think that the conversations that Ellie and Jackson had surrounding disability were so incredibly done and I really loved that aspect of the story. Overall, I gave it a 3.5 out of 5 stars. Alright everybody, so those were the last 8 books that I read in the month of August 2024. If you are interested in the first 2 wrap-ups where I talk about the first 9 and the middle 8 books that I read, then those are up on my channel now and you guys can check them out. Let me know down below if you have read any of these books and what you thought of them. And I I'll see you all in my next video. Goodbye!